Now, for our next conversation, the Midas Touch, Battle for AI's Future, please welcome interviewer Alex Conrad, senior editor, Forbes, and Vinod Kosla, entrepreneur, investor, and technologist. Awesome. Well, I, I would ask Vinod what you're most excited about today, but we have the cover of the current issue of Forbes right there behind us, so it kind of gives, gives the game away a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Why is AI so exciting to you, having been through multiple technology cycles in your career? Right. Well, if you think about it, the steam engine amplified human muscle and every engine since has. This is the first time we get amplification of the human brain. And within some short period of time, and we can debate that, almost every function human beings can do will be done more scalably, probably better than humans can do. And that's exciting. It's a whole era in humanity, I think, in terms of its implication for human beings, but also for all businesses. So we, we've gotten big promises in the past from Silicon Valley about um, when when these technologies will replace uh, humans that we have to maybe talk to, like, like right now I'm in the, the hell of waiting months for a doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. I know that you uh, believe that AI can put a doctor basically on every smartphone. How far off really is that possibility? Well, two things. First, entrepreneurs won't be entrepreneurs if they don't have hubris. And the press loves to amplify the hubris, so I'll place it on you or would be, <laughs> okay. you know, you don't get on the cover if you say the world isn't going to change. Tomorrow's going to be like today. So, um, but we also tend to overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. Hmm. You know, imagining a world without the internet, imagine a world without mobile phones. That was the prevailing power paradigm in 2000. I remember talking to the Prime Minister of India about this. They were still trying to increase the penetration of landlines in the country in the year 2000. Wow. And technology always surprises. So it'll surprise us again. It will surprise us again, probably at a larger scale than most people imagine. A big uh, topic of conversation in the cover story that you participated in with us, you know, thank you for that, was um, the geopolitical implications of AI, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to other uh, powers that might be uh, in a race against the US in some ways, like China. Yeah. What should this audience be you know, thinking about when it comes to this geopolitical implication? Well, we're clearly in a techno-economic war with China. And whoever wins that will have huge economic influence, and because of economic influence, influence on policy and politics and ideology. And I, for one, don't want the Chinese ideology to win. President Xi clearly believes they have a superior ide ideology. Uh, I don't think he's doing it just to win. He believes he has a superior ideology. I happen to value liberal values more. What, what um, gives you confidence that the U.S. can actually slow down China or stay in the lead in the AI race if um, you know, there are a lot of smart people and a lot of resources in China trying to copy a lot of our cutting-edge AI technology? Yeah. So China has the advantage of directing bulk resources towards problems. Uh, the West has advantages. It's not just the West. There's plenty of other countries around the world that have the same liberal democratic values. And one of your investments is an AI model company in India, right? Uh, we have an AI model company in India, an AI model company in J uh, Japan, mm -hmm. because kanji is a different kind of script, so you do things differently. Um, even how you treat blue lights and green lights and traffic lights is sort of confusing. It's very cultural and local. Um, but I think whoever wins this race uh, will have social influence globally. Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, most parts of the world. And what can we do? I think our entrepreneurial ecosystem is so robust 
and so much more open to creativity and imagination. That's our strength. Innovation is our strength. Are you optimistic that the US and um, our private and public sectors are aligned and moving in the right direction to win the AI race? You know, so far, it's been pretty good. It's uh, most innovation in AI has come from uh, the US mostly, um, some in other parts of the world. Uh, so Am I optimistic about that? Yes. Am I complacent about that? Absolutely not. I think we should do everything to increase our pace of innovation and slow down the Chinese, including things like chip bans and things. OK. Now, I, I know you've said you, you broadly speaking, supported uh, the current administration's executive order on AI last fall. Um, and you believe that maybe a, a, a light amount of regulation is, is the correct course here. Um, the, obviously, the opponent of the current administration in the presidential election, Donald Trump, has signaled that he wants to sort of strip away any regulation about AI at all. Why, why is that maybe not the right route to, to move faster? You know, any powerful technology, be it nuclear, biotechnology, AI, has benefits and costs and risks. So we have to balance as a society, the risks and benefits. There's people, extremists, what I call the EA extremists, um, uh, who are pressing for no AI development. And then there's people who just want a wild west. I don't think either is a good answer. Balanced approach to risk is what matters. I do, agree, I do think of China as the biggest risk. There are other risks. The risk like bioterrorism, somebody in their lab alone doesn't even have to be a nation state, can uh, wreak havoc. Uh, so we have to be cautious, we have to worry, but that doesn't mean we slow down progress. One thing I do find interesting is that um, in this AI debate in Silicon Valley, anyone who, who wants any sort of caution or you know, rules at all is, is called a doomer and, and a decel or decelerationist. Uh, what, you know, if someone called you that, why would you reject that uh, label? Well, I, I don't care what people label, okay. right? The, the problem is if you add a label, the press reports it, <laughs> and it gets amplified. So people, like Trump, get used to attaching labels to things okay. because they get amplified. Um, in fact, I think we should be sensible about the risks. And frankly, look, I'm... A, uh, I'm a techno-optimist. My Twitter handle has been about techno-optimism for years and years. But I say you have to practice because of the large impact technology is having on society. Uh, and we come back to that. We have to do it with empathy and with care. So I sort of say I'm a techno-optimist with real empathy and care. For the people who get disrupted when it's when we have fun talking about disruption, it's not a lot of fun when you're disrupted. And the disrupted fight back. Uh, we've seen this in the climate area. And it slows things down. So bringing everybody along is a good idea. We'll definitely come back um, to some of that tech, tech, technology that has you optimistic in mm -hmm. a couple minutes. But first, speaking of disruption, uh, you've been pretty outspoken about the presidential election. I, I, it's my understanding you are not a fan of uh, former President Donald Trump, um, but you also identify as an independent, right? Yeah. So, so what is what is your uh, big argument? You know, if you have some business leaders here, and a minute to kind of make your case. <laughs> uh, you're talking about risks for a minute. Okay. Climate risk is the biggest risk. So, I used to be a fiscal voter. Now I'm a climate and fiscal voter. Uh, my view is on Trump specifically. There's a difference between Democrats and Republicans and, frankly, e extremists like Tom. Uh, would you want your children to have the values that Trump has? Accused of rape, accused of lying, cheating, all those values. That's a very simple test for me. That's the first test I, I apply. I couldn't imagine, no matter how much Trump promised me, and he's promising the crypto guys, no regulation, some other people, reduced tax. Those 
a valuable but not the most valuable thing in deciding who should be president of this company. We should be a values-driven society. And he's basically ruined that. And this is... <laughs> and, and it really isn't about Democrats and Republicans, because most Republicans would agree with me. Um, but they're afraid to challenge him, because if you've challenged him, you sort of lost your vote because of this unusual uh, voting system we have. Well, you'd probably get a different next question if Steve Forbes was on stage right now. But um, my question is, Silicon Valley, do you see it uh, moving to support Donald Trump for business reasons? Or do you believe, you know, when you talk to your peers, what is the sort of state of play when it comes to this election? Look, a very small minority uh, supports Trump. And they're mostly of the libertarian variety. Um, uh, so uh, it's a very small minority, in my view. I just saw an analysis yesterday that said uh, Silicon Valley is supporting Democrats over Republicans four to one in terms of dollar contributions. So, but not viral tweets. Not Dollars maybe more than tweets, because it seems from social media that there are a lot of outspoken people like David Sachs who are leading Silicon Valley yeah. right. Look. Twitter has become sort of this megaphone for the extreme right. Used to be a little bit to the extreme left. There's no middle ground in social media, unfortunately. And we should be wary of that. I ignore all the input I get on Twitter because it's almost always either the extremists on the right or the extremists on the left. There's DEI extremists and there's MAGA extremists. You know, I have a simple test. You're a MAGA extremist if you believe the election was stolen. It's not about policy. It's not about other things. If we believe that, then we are on path to destroy democracy. That's another reason I think Trump is very, very dangerous. Not for the next four years. It's for the next 15 okay. that we should be worrying about. And as a, I know you don't like to call yourself a venture capitalist, but everyone else calls you one of the best venture capitalists of all time. You do think in these very long time horizons, um, mm -hmm. when similar in technology or any other aspect of society, right? Yeah. So I gave a lawyer a TED talk in April this year about a dozen really transformative te the approaches to society that almost certainly can happen if we let them happen. I'm almost certain with the next 10, 15 years, we can have free doctors for everybody on the planet, or near free. It's the cost of computing. We have nearly, nearly free personal tutors for every child on the planet. Because AI will be the AI tutor, a doctor will be um, an AI doctor. And whether you're talking about structural engineers or oncologists, almost all expertise will be free. Think about it. That will be possible in the next decade. It may take 20 or 25 years for it to go from 2% or 3% adoption or early adoption to full penetration of society. Uh, how deflationary is that? So first we will see, my bet is for the next five to 10 years, huge productivity growth. And I wrote about it in 2016. I said, we will see great abundance with AI. That was 2016. We'll see productivity growth. Uh, GDP growth and increasing income disparity, uh, unfortunately. I think we will see that, and it'll look like good economic metrics the next decade. And companies on the margin will have their revenue grow faster than their employees. Revenue per, per employee will go up for certain. But at some point, this becomes very deflationary beyond the decade because, you know, you take the resources of a million doctors making 300K a year, that's $300 billion worth of value out of the economy. I think the measure of GDP will be wrong. Interesting. The way we measure GDP will no longer hold. It's already starting to be true because my iPhone has more power than a Cray computer, uh, but GDP in computing has actually uh, not gone up with the num amount of compute. 
So we will need new, new metrics for productivity, Absolutely. I think, across the board, even to how employees' productivity is measured. Yeah. I know energy is important to you, too. Look, every yeah. part of employee role, an AI accountant, AI salesperson, AI customer support, all that is happening today. Mm -hmm. And it'll happen in the small companies first and then creep up. But it is definitely going to happen. It would be my dream to talk for an hour more about AI, but I do want to make sure we just hear quickly about why you're excited about your energy investments and spending a lot of time yeah. there, too. Well, we made, you know, large bets is a lot of fun. Uh, we made our first open AI investment in 2018. It was a very large one, even by the scope of our investments. But we invested in Commonwealth Fusion at the same time. Um, one of my other forecasts, we can eliminate most cars in most cities. Why? Because AI self-driving allows not so much for self-driving, which will increase congestion in cities, but a new kind of public transit system. Interestingly, this little startup uh, has bid on a couple of projects and never lost one. It's won outright against the big players in public transit. So I would say in so many areas, expertise will be near free, labor through robotics will be near free, computer programming will become so free that computing will become more like electricity, this utility in the background, than something you use. You know, so far, humans have had to learn computers, whether it's learning your Bloomberg terminal or learning SAP or how to insert a row in Excel. Computers will learn humans, so humans don't have to learn computers. You won't have to say you know how to use an app. An app will learn how to use you or serve your needs. I don't know if, that's, if I think that's cool or a little spooky or both. <laughs> But I do know that anyone here well, who's you don't get a choice on whether it happens. Fair enough. You can decide whether it's spooky or not, but it's going to happen. Fair enough. And anyone here working on alternatives to New York's congestion pricing model? Sounds like they should be talking to Vinod. So, um... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> congestion model, it's such a silly idea to restrict consumption when you can do much better system. There's only one thing fixed in a city, is street width. If you can increase passengers per hour, it's a very big deal. But I want to finish by saying almost all areas of climate, because that's where you took me, whether it's fusion or super hard geothermal, almost all areas of large carbon emission will be replaced by technologies, and watch this, cheaper than their current uh, fossil comparators. We are well on our way over the next 10, 15 years. We won't have to obsolete coal plants. I say we will re-equip them, not obsolete them. We won't uh, shut down cement plants. We will re-equip them to be low carbon. So very promising technologies on the way, almost all these areas. Well, you'll have to be very brave to bet against Vinod on one of these long-term predictions. Um, thank you so much, Vinod. Thank Kosla. you, everybody.